Hello everyone, I am Avinash Kambadakone from Mass General Hospital and I will be talking about imaging of urolithiasis. These are my disclosures. So in this lecture, the learning objectives include the discussion on the role of imaging in diagnosis of urolithiasis, focusing particularly on role of CT. I will follow that by providing an urologist perspective on imaging, including its implications in treatment planning and response assessment. In the end, we will review the radiation dose concerns related to CT and the strategies to diminish that risk. Let's begin with the clinical perspective. Urolithiasis is a universal problem affecting patients both in the developed and the developing countries. Approximately 1.2 million Americans are affected annually by stone disease and it is estimated that up to 14% of men and 6% of women will develop stone disease during their lifetime. Stone disease has a high relapse rate and in up to 50% of patients they can recur in the first 5 to 10 years and in 75% within 20 years. If you look at the trends, some of the recent studies have shown that the prevalence of urinary stones has progressively increased in the past few decades. The rising prevalence is multifactorial and could be attributed to risk factors such as obesity, high animal protein and sodium consumption, and dehydration. Urolithiasis has a significant impact on healthcare system due to the direct costs involved in treatment as well as the management of morbidity associated with complications such as infection and chronic renal failure. Now let's go over the different stone types. Urinary stones are composed of a combination of both organic and inorganic crystals and proteins. Calcium-based stones which include calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate account for nearly 70 to 80 percent of all stones. True white stones composed of magnesium ammonium phosphate account for 5 to 15 percent and uric acid stones occurring in acidic urine constitute for about 5 to 10 percent. Other drugs including cysteine, xanthine, protein matrix stones as well as drug induced calculi are seen in less than 5% of cases. Now coming to the role of imaging, they have a central role in the diagnosis of urinary stones. The various modalities include plane radiography, ultrasound and CT. Plane radiography uh, has a limited role in the evaluation of stone disease as it is not a sensitive modality because many stones are not radio-opaque and many radio-opaque stones are easily obscured by bowel content projecting over the urinary tract. However, they do have utility in treatment planning, particularly shock wave lithotripsy, and, and are helpful in post-treatment evaluation such as for looking at uh, ureteral stand placement and estimation of residual stone burden. Ultrasound uh, is being increasingly performed for screening of patients with stones. This modality is easily available, portable, and does not involve ionizing radiation. However, Ultrasound is operator dependent and can be challenging in patients with large body habitus. Anatomically, it is excellent for evaluation of kidney and urinary bladder, but is limited for looking at the ureters. On imaging, stones are echogenic uh, and they have posterior acoustic shadowing, which allows in the diagnosis of stones. While ultrasound has limited sensitivity for detection of intrarenal calculi in comparison to CT, it is highly sensitive for detection of ureteral obstruction in the setting of acute flank pain. Therefore, ultrasound is not an unreasonable examination for surveillance of patients with known stone disease, particularly when it is paired with plain radiography. And it is the test of choice for pregnant patients given its lack of ionizing radiation. Now, if you compare the sensitivity of CT and ultrasound for diagnosis of stone disease, this chart of multiple st studies demonstrates that CT continues to have a consistent higher sensitivity than ultrasound in urolithiasis. Now, coming to role of CT, it has several advantages over other imaging techniques. The, including it's widely available, accessible, CT can be performed rapidly, it does not require the administration of contrast material, it's an accurate and validated test and also allows for screening of multiple body parts.
So unenhanced CT or non-contrast CT is the initial investigation of choice in suspected urolithiasis and in fact stone protocol CT accounts for nearly 22% of all CT performed in the ER for acute abdominal pain. It is a highly accurate test and in addition to detecting stones, it also helps in the identification of other causes of acute abdomen such as appendicitis, torsion or diverticulitis. Identification of ureteric stones on imaging has been shown to alter management in nearly 60% of patients suspected of having acute renal colic. An additional benefit of CT is that it allows detection of urinary disorders like congenital abnormalities, infections and neoplasms, the diagnosis of which can sometimes have greater clinical relevance than the stone disease itself. Now coming to the technique, at Mass General we perform all stone protocol CT with the patient in the prone position, except in those circumstances when the patient cannot lie prone. Scanning in prone position allows differentiation of stones which are stuck at the vesicouretic junction versus those which are free in the urinary bladder as stones free in the bladder drop to the dependent position. The actual scan coverage for a stone protocol CT extends from the top of the kidneys to the base of the urinary bladder. Uh, as I said earlier, intravenous contrast administration is not routinely required for uh, stone protocol CT but may be useful for differentiating distal ureteral stone from phlebolites or vascular calcification and in the characterization of incidental renal masses. In addition to actual images, we routinely obtain 3 mm coronal and sagittal reformations for stone disease. Now talking about the multiplanar reformations, we find that this, these are quite useful particularly for improving detection of stones which are not seen on actual images, particularly the stones in the renal poles and the ureters. Coronal and sagittal reformations also allow differentiation of stones from phlebolites and calcified vascular plaques because they allow easy tracking of the ureter from the renal pelvis all the way to the urinary bladder. And also, since the urothelial system is coronally oriented, urologists prefer to look at these images for treatment planning. Now let's go over how stones look on radiographs and CT. While majority of stones are radio-opaque on radiographs, uric acid stones are radiolucent and cystic stones are mildly radio-opaque. However, all these stones are radio-opaque on CT. That is, virtually all stones are radio-opaque on CT because they have a density of over 200 Hounsfield units. The stones which are radiolucent on CT include the pure matrix stones and stones made up of pure indenavir, that is, protease, uh, protease inhibitor drugs used in the treatment of HIV. Often administration of intravenous contrast and acquisition of delayed phase images might be needed for detection of these uh, radiolucent stones on CT. Coming to ureteral stones, in addition to direct visualization of the hyperdense stones, their identification in the ureter is often facilitated by presence of certain secondary features such as upstream hydroureter or hydronephrosis. I'll talk a little bit in more detail about the secondary signs. There are several secondary signs of obstruction which have been described on CT. The most reliable signs include hydroureter, hydronephrosis, perinephric stranding, periureteral edema, and unilateral renal enlargement. But it is important to remember that the absence of hydronephrosis or hydroureter does not indicate absence of an obstruction. Less reliable findings of obstruction described on CT include unilateral absence of the white renal pyramid, thickening of the lateral fascia and the perinephric edema. Uh, there are studies which show that when five or more secondary signs of obstruction are present in proximal ureteral stones which are greater than 6 mm, it's usually an indication that the patient likely needs some sort of intervention for removal of stones. Now, one of the challenges with the diagnosis of distal ureteral stones is their differentiation from vascular calcification, particularly phlebolids. Now, there are certain signs which can help in the differentiation. Ureteral stones are of varying shape, while phlebolids are usually round. On bone window settings, stones show central dense areas, while phlebolids have a central lucency. There are two more signs 
uh, which are often helpful. The soft tissue rim sign, which refers to a halo of soft tissue attenuation around the stone and is very specific for ureteral calculi rather than flabolids. The soft tissue rim here, as seen on this image, uh, represents the edematous wall of the ureter. The second sign, which is often helpful, is the comet tail sign, which is created by an eccentric tapering soft tissue area adjacent to the calcification and is a reliable feature in the diagnosis of flibolids. Uh, after discussing the imaging appearances of stones on CT, let's look at the urologist's expect expectations. Now, in the era of precision medicine, the urologist's expectations have risen beyond the mere detection of stone and its location. The urologists now demand more information from a CT, including details such as stone burden, stone composition, stone fragility, assessment of treatment response, and identification of markers of metabolic disease. Let's look at how imaging help helps meet some of these urologist expectations. Now, among the various factors dictating treatment strategies, stone burden is one of the most important. In this chart, you can see how the size of kidney stones determines the type of treatment. While asymptomatic patients with stones less than a centimeter often undergo observation, symptomatic patients are often treated with lithotripsy or ureterinoscopy. In patients with stones larger than a centimeter, the type of treatment depends on the stone size, that is in patients with stones larger than 2 cm often undergo nephrolithotomy. For stone burden assessment on CT, linear bidimensional measurements should often be performed and reported. Again, in the ureteral stones as well, treatment depends on stone size and type of procedure as seen in this chart. Stones larger than a centimeter are often treated with urologic intervention. The type of intervention depending on the location in the proximal or the distal ureter. For stones which are smaller than a centimeter, the management depends on clinical features. For example, patients with fever or signs of infection often undergo either emergent stent placement or nephrostomy. In those patients without fever and who are able to take orally, conservative management is preferred. In those patients with nausea and pain, lithotripsy or erythrorhinoscopy is performed. The stone size has some implications on stone clearance. For example, a meta-analysis showed that stones smaller than 5 mm lodged in the ureters spontaneously cleared in nearly 68% of patients. Now, while linear measurements are routinely performed, they are not suitable in irregularly contoured stones as you can see in this example with a staghorn calculi. In such situations, measuring the stone volume eliminates this problem. Now, technological advances has allowed development of several threshold-based CAD algorithms and semi-automated methods which allow rapid estimation of stone volume. Stone volume measured in such a way has been shown to be a significant predictor of treatment success at lithotripsy. For example, stone burden exceeding 700 cubic millimeters has been shown to be a predictor of failure of lithotripsy. Another key determinant of stone management is the knowledge of stone composition. This is important because uric acid stones may be treated with urinary alkalinization as a first-line treatment, with surgical treatment being reserved for stones that do not respond to medical therapy. Even among non-uric acid stones, co composition has implications for management as it affects the efficacy of lithotripsy. While brucite, cysteine, and calcium oxalate stones are hard and more resistant, struvite stones often fragment very easily. Traditionally, the determination of stone composition has been performed using attenuation values. There are a range of numbers reported to differentiate different types of stones. It is important to note here that the uric acid stones often measure less than 500 Hounsfield units. While these numbers provide accurate differentiation among stones in a phantom study with accuracy range going, ex uh, uh, going up to 77%, differentiation is more complicated and less reliable in vivo. Attenuation, among other factors, is dependent on CT technique, stone size, and accurate placement of the region of interest. Moreover, attenuation measurement becomes more complicated in patients who have stones of mixed composition.
Now, one of the innovations in determination of stone composition has been the introduction of dual energy CT. I will briefly go over the principles of dual energy CT. Dual energy CT is an exciting innovation which as the name suggests conceptually involves simultaneous scanning at two different energies that is high and low energy. When you scan tissues at two different energies, different tissues behave differently. So the dual energy CT algorithms exploit the differences in the attenuation of tissues at different energies to allow determination of tissue composition. Let's see how dual energy CT helps differentiate between the different types of stones. Now if you look at this table, because uric acid stones have lighter elements such as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, they behave differently than non-uric acid stones which have heavier elements like calcium and phosphorus. So if you look at this phantom of uric acid and calcium, their attenuation profiles are different at 80 and 140 kVp. While there is a reduction in the attenuation of calcium at 140 kVp, for uric acid you can see that there is a slight increase in the attenuation. So, dual energy CT algorithms exploit this different to differentiate between uric acid and non-uric acid stones. Now, different dual energy CT platforms use different types of material decomposition algorithms to make this differentiation. For example, the dual source dual energy CT uses a three material decomposition algorithm to color code the stones on a CT image to allow easy differentiation of uric acid and non-uric acid stones. So if you look at this example, uric acid stones are coded as red on the top image and the calcium stones are coded as blue. The rapid KVP switching a dual energy CT platform uses a two material decomposition algorithm for material differentiation by creating basis material pairs. Now you could differentiate between the uric acid and non-uric acid stones using the water and iodine images. Now while uric acid stones are radio opaque on a water image and radio lucent on iodine image, non-uric acid stones as you can see in the lower uh, bottom row of images are radio opaque on both water and iodine images. Additional post-processing on the different platforms using effective Z maps also allows uh, differentiation of different types of non-uric acid stones as you can see in this cluster map. A meta-analysis which looked at 13 studies uh, on the value of dual energy CT found that this technology had a high accuracy for differentiation of uric acid and non-uric acid stones which were larger than 3 millimeters. Now, MDCT uh, also has a role in determining stone fragility and therefore their susceptibility to lithotripsy. On high resolution thick thin section images when seen on bone window settings, stones which are heterogeneous uh, that is have areas of low density have been shown to be more fragile at lithotripsy versus stones which are homogeneous without any internal uh, heterogeneity. Now in addition to providing valuable information about stone characteristics such as size, composition and fragility, multi-detector CT also aids in the pre-surgical planning of interventional procedures such as uh, identifying appropriate calyx for percutaneous access during procedures such as PCNL. It also helps ascertain a safe path for puncture by depicting the relationship of the kidney to surrounding organs such as the spleen, liver and the colon. Now this is crucial and particularly important in patients with spina bifida and severe scoliosis in whom the standard fluoroscopic guidance may be unsafe. Now a metric often used by the urologist is the skin to stone distance which is measured from the center of the stone to the skin surface on axial CT images and which has been found to be a reliable predictor of stone free status following lithotripsy for lower pole stones. A skin to stone distance exceeding 10 cm is considered to be a predictor of failure at lithotripsy. Now, in addition to having benefits in patients uh, for pretreatment evaluation, in patients who undergo treatment, 
follow up imaging plays an important role the purpose of imaging following either urologic intervention or medical therapy is essentially fourfold to confirm stone free status to identify the presence of residual stones to rule out obstruction of the urinary system and to identify procedural complications in this example in a patient with bilateral staghorn calculi and left ureteric stone who underwent lithotripsy you can see on the post treatment ct there are several residual stone fragments in both renal pelvises and a significant stone burden often necessitates further treatment now this patient had to undergo percutaneous nephrolithotomy for removal of the residual stone fragments one important aspect of post treatment follow up is the distinction between ureteral stents and stones as it is important to identify stones along the stent in the ureter prior to stent removal now stents and stones can have the same ct appearance on soft tissue window settings therefore using bone window settings allow distinction between the stones and the stent in fact it is very important to trace the stent along its course in the ureter to identify small ureteral calculi alongside the stent and report it to the urologist prior to stent removal now in patients who are managed medically it is common practice to follow up patients with conventional radiography at uh, intervals after initial diagnosis Although multi-detector CT is being increasingly used in the management of stone disease, a repeat CT may not be the best follow-up option due to radiation dose concerns. In such situations, the choice of imaging modality for the follow-up can usually be made based on the visibility of the stone on CT scout images. These stones, uh, those stones which are visible on a scout image and has an attenuation of over 300 Hansfield units, can be followed up with abdominal radiographs. while stones measuring less than 200 hansfield units and those which are radio lucent on scout images need to be followed up with ct now that brings us to an important aspect of role of ct in diagnosis of patients with stone disease that is despite the benefits of ct in stone disease a key concern is the ionizing radiation risk now this is particularly relevant in urolithiasis because of the high relapse rate and patients often needing multiple ct scans during their lifetime thereby increasing their cumulative radiation dose exposure now the effective radiation dose for a single non contrast ct can range anywhere from 3 to 18 millisieverts so it is important to develop strategies for dose reduction the two main pillars of radiation dose reduction in imaging or appropriate utilization and optimization of ct protocols ct protocol optimization involves making changes to several parameters during scanning to reduce radiation dose now let's discuss four important practical strategies we have employed in our practice to reduce radiation dose The first step involves limiting scan coverage area that is instead of scanning from the diaphragm to the ischium like for a routine abdomen pelvic ct for stone protocol ct we scan from the top of the kidneys to the pubic symphysis thereby saving 10 to 15 slices which can reduce radiation dose by nearly 20% In addition, performing targeted follow-up studies with scanning limited to the area of interest also minimizes radiation exposure. For example, scanning only the pelvis to confirm the passage of distal ureteral stone can limit radiation dose. Second strategy involves reducing tube current or MAS using automated tube modulation techniques and certain operator defined parameters such as noise index or reference MAS. one can reduce the tube current to accomplish dose reduction at mass general we incrementally increase the noise index for follow up ct stone protocol ct thereby achieving gradual dose reduction for follow up scans a third strategy is the low kvp exams stone protocol ct being a high contrast exam reducing kvp not only reduces radiation dose but also improves image contrast which is particularly helpful for detection of calculi now reducing kvp from 120 to 80 has shown dose benefits anywhere from 35 to 
A fourth strategy we have found useful is use of uh, five millimeter thick sections for diagnostic acquisition instead of thinner acquisition and supplementing that with uh, two to three millimeter coronal and sagittal reformated images, which allow not only allows the diagnosis of small stones, but also reduces radiation dose by nearly 20%. Using a combination of all these strategies has allowed us to reduce radiation dose by nearly 40 to 70 percent from the standard dose. While these strategies help radiation dose, they also increase image noise and therefore can diminish image quality. The recently introduced iterative reconstruction algorithms help mitigate the image quality penalties. Now these algorithms which are available across multiple vendors help diminish image noise thereby improving image quality while reducing radiation dose. This is an example of a patient in whom uh, we applied the multiple dose reduction strategies and iterative reconstruction algorithm uh, for a follow-up scan in 2009 and you can see that the dose for the follow-up scan was 2 millisieverts compared to 11 millisieverts for a prior scan in 2007. Now you can see despite the significant dose reduction, the image quality and the diagnostic performance are comparable in these two exams. If you look at the literature and timeline over the years, several investigators have shown using dose reduction technique that the radiation dose for a stone protocol CT has significantly reduced over the past few decades. In fact, when a time when a low, ultra low dose stone protocol CT which has a radiation exposure lower than a 2 view KUB might not be a distant dream. So with that, uh, to summarize, the scope of imaging as we discussed has extended beyond the mere detection of stone and its location. The current strategy involves use of imaging to determine stone composition, fragility and quantification which has great implications in treatment planning. Imaging has an important role to play in post-treatment follow-up. Now despite its advantages, it is uh, important that we are cognizant of the radiation dose concerns and one should use various simple strategies to lower CT radiation dose. Before I conclude, I would like to show this case. This patient was found to have multiple stones on an initial CT and uh, we characterize these stones in the left renal pelvis as uric acid stones based on dual energy CT post-processing. Now this patient received medical therapy for urinary alkalinization and you can see on the follow-up CT all the stones have dissolved. Now this picture uh, drives home the value of CT in pre-treatment characterization of stones and this impact it has on management strategies. For example, it prevented this patient from having an invasive surgical procedures which is not without complications. With that, I, will, or I would also like to acknowledge the contribution of my radiology colleagues, mentor and fellows as well as our urology colleagues for contribution with the material and for taking care of our patients. Thank you for your kind attention and stay well.